welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Get down on my knees and go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to, would you join me in standing and reverencing the Lord? Father God, we come before you in this house, Lord, and we are just so grateful that we have the opportunity to come into the house of the Lord, Father, to freely worship. God, we thank you that we don't come into this place to hear from a man, to hear from a woman, to hear from a band. But, Father, we come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior pastor of this church. And, Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to see in our ears to hear the word that you would cause us to hear this, this morning. Father, as we leave this place, we would be better equipped and impacted to go out into our communities, into our families, into our circles of influence, Father, and preach and teach the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for your anointing and your presence in this place and amongst each and every one of us. And Lord, we welcome the Holy Spirit as our teacher and as our guide to, to show us things, Father, to speak the word into each and every one of us to plant the seed. And God, we also ask that your presence would be amongst all the other churches across the Inland Empire and all around the world that are delivering your message and your gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Adventist brothers and sisters, our Lutherans and our Episcopalians and our Baptist brothers and sisters. Lord, we also ask that you'd set your hand upon Ecclesia Christian Center, Father, uh, on Inland Christian Center, on Emmanuel Baptist, and all the churches in the Inland Empire, Father, that are going and preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't think of ourselves as better than anybody, but Father, as co-laborers in the word of in the body of Christ. And we just give you the praise and we give you the glory in Jesus' mighty name. We all said, amen. amen. Well, praise God. I'll tell you what, it is uh, exciting for me to bring the word of the Lord this morning. Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah are uh, just taking some time. Uh, what's the term dad uses? He says, uh, grandpa is chasing grandma. That's cool for y'all to, to hear that, but man, as me and, me and my sister Jess, I don't know if we ever get used to him, you know, saying that. Every time, just imagine when he says that, I'm in the control room going, oh, man. So they're just getting their hearts prepared for the up and coming Easter. They'll be with us next week, but I'll tell you what, what we're going to do is we're going to take a break this month um, as we get prepared for the up and coming Easter holiday, the, the beautiful, wonderful opportunity for us as a church to gather together and to celebrate the resurrection of our coming King. Praise God. Woo! Buddha didn't raise from the, from the dead. You know, uh, Muhammad didn't raise from the dead, but our Jesus Christ, I'll tell you what. So we're going to take a break from uh, the book of Hebrews. We'll be back after, the, after, after Easter holiday. So what we're going to do today is I want to bring a message. And I really feel like God put it on my heart, especially leading into the Easter season. That's a good word for each and every one of us. I encourage you as we go about this morning to really grab a hold of it. Uh, what we're going to talk about, the title of this morning's message is called The Game Changer. The Game Changer. Now what that is, is that's primarily a sports Term. But it doesn't, it's not limited only to sports. We've, we've seen that, um, we've seen this term and, and throughout different things such as wars and battles and, and po politics and all sorts of different things. Basically what a game changer signifies is that, that um, something is heading in a certain direction. In, in the sports term, in the sports terminology, uh, one team is, is winning over another team and it seems as if the game is set. All right, one team is going to win. And the game-changing moment is generally when something happens, some, some magnificent play or some horrible error either way, um, changes the course of the game. And all of a sudden, that team, which everybody thought was out of the game, that was done for, is now back in the game. Now, when I think back, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm a tremendous sports fan. I, I watch when it's, when it's on TV, when it's in, in high definition. I watch NFL, you know, because it's fun to watch. And um, I, so I wouldn't say that I'm a, I'm a tremendous sports fan, but I remember a game-changing moment. And, and going back to my head, just to kind of bring you to what we're thinking about this, this morning, is I remember it was during one of the Super Bowls. I couldn't even tell you which one. I couldn't even tell you who they were playing against, but I remember it was the Giants. It wasn't this last one. But I remember it was in the fourth quarter. It was towards the end of the Super Bowl, and the Giants were down. I couldn't even remember who they are playing. But I remember their quarterback, Eli Manning, uh, he got the ball, and he was... He was, they were coming after him, and it didn't look like this play had anything left for him. And I remember he had to throw with his left hand, which I believe he's, he's right hand. He had to throw with whichever, his opposite hand. And he made a play, got the first down, brought the team within scoring distance, and all of a sudden, that was a game-changing moment. Everybody thought that the Giants were out. Everybody was already out and ready to go. And, and all of a sudden, right at the last moment of that game, he brought a game-changing moment. 
to that game. You know, I want to bring that back. And we're not talking about football. You didn't come into church this morning at 10 o'clock in the morning for Pastor Luke to tell you about football, to tell you about sports. But what we're going to talk about is I want to talk about the game-changing moment in yours and my life. You know, we live life. Let's just be honest. Life happens. And sometimes it feels like we could be on the team that is losing. But I want to tell you something. I want to bring some things to, you, to your eyes and to your attention this morning out of the Word of God that is a game changer in yours and my life. And the fact that you and I might feel like due to the present circumstances, due to what's going on in our life, that we might be on that losing team, that our future might be set ahead of us. But let me tell you something. There is a game changer that God has dropped a bomb, like I like to tell the young adults, on each and every one of our lives and turned everything upside down. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to the book of John in the 15th chapter. Talking about the game changer. Now here in John the 15th chapter, as you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of background. John the 15th chapter, Jesus Christ is walking with his disciples in the garden. And in the beginning of John the 15th chapter, he equates himself to the vine, the true vine, looking at probably as they were walking past the vineyard. He says that he is the vine, that we, the people of God, are the branches. The branches should bear fruit. That God the Father is the vine dresser, the vine owner, the, 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 the person that tends to the vine. And he goes on in the subject in the first part of the 15th chapter of John, and he addresses uh, you and I as the branches of, of the vine, the one true vine, he refers to himself, in our bearing fruit. We're going to talk about that subject in a moment, fruit. But then all of a sudden, as he begins to emphasize this, this, um, this theme of being the vine, he kind of changes he kind of changes his pace and he kind of changes it to, to start to talk about love. And, 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 and in John the 15th chapter, if you ever just wanted to read an action-packed verse or action-packed chapter in the Bible just to sit down and have a good read to know what, how God feels about you, I encourage you, sit down, open your Bibles up and read John 15. And I'll tell you what, don't read John 15, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, 4 and just going all three until you get to verse number 16 and say, okay, I read it, now what? I want you to read it, digest it. Think about what he's saying. Think about what he's saying. Because each verse in John, the 15th chapter, packs such a punch that it's just like, I mean, it's like a slap you in the face chapter of the Bible. I'll tell you what. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pick up as Jesus is walking with his disciples in the garden. And in John, the 15th chapter, in the 16th verse, Jesus Christ picks up and he says to his disciples, You did not choose me, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Now this verse is jam-packed with information. I mean, this verse, I think, see, what we have a tendency to do, church, is we read the Bible, we read through things, and we just kind of go to the next verse. We just go right on to verse number 17 and say, okay, great, wonderful. But this verse is exploding with such a wealth of the gospel, such a wealth of God's opinion towards you and I, that it's just, I wanted to take a moment and spend some time looking into this verse, and I want to pull some things out of this verse this morning, some concepts. Now, these things aren't necessarily new to you. They, they, these things may be things that you've already heard, that you may know, but what I want to do is I want to change your perspective. The game changer. The team, if that team thinks that they're going to lose and if they don't try to fight, to, to come back and to make a play, tell you what, they've already lost. But I want to change your perspective, yours and my perspective. Oftentimes, we look at life and we think, okay, God can do it. God's wonderful, God's great, but yet we don't give the effort to do so. And I want to change our perspective through what the Word of the Lord says in that verse by bringing some points out of that verse that I believe when you grab a hold of these things and you walk out of the four walls of this building, you will be impacted. You'll be able to be an effective minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ to all of the world, to all the inland parts, to your families, to your friends, to your workplaces, to whoever it is, whoever it is that is around you. Because you and I are all called to be full-time ministers of the gospel. And we're going to get into that in a moment. So, are you guys with me this morning? You want to talk about the game changer? Can we, can we talk about a couple things out of John 15, 16? All right, listen, John 15, 16, number one this morning out of the 16th verse, Jesus Christ is speaking to his 12 and he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Now here Jesus Christ is speaking to his disciples and the number one point is that you were chosen by God. Now here Jesus Christ is speaking to his 12 and he's fulfilling, uh, he's referring back to an earlier part in the book of John where uh, he's fulfilling scripture about um, him, the coming Messiah saying that he would pick 12 and one of them would be a devil. But let me tell you something. You and I, the disciples of Jesus Christ, you and I here today, we have been chosen 
by God. Before we even knew that we need God, God has chosen us. Now, let me say this. Um, before I get any further, I want to say this off the bat, that a lot of people will take this verse and verses similar to this to say that only a few select people will be chosen by God, and we don't know who those people are. But let me tell you something. We're going to get into this in a moment. God sent his son, Jesus Christ. John 3, 16 tells us he sent Jesus Christ so that we might be saved. You know, it doesn't matter who, who is and who isn't. God sent his son so that each and every one of us in this place could be chosen. He chose us before we even knew. The value that God has placed upon you and I is this. That before you and I even were born, before you and I even realized that we had a need of a Savior, before you and I were even our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, our ancestors, before they were even in existence, God knew that you and I would need a Savior. God knew that there was a gap between man and God. And he said, you know what? I love these men. I love mankind enough to send something into that gap to pay the price so that they could know me better. And God bought you and I with the price of his son, Jesus Christ, on that cross to bear our sickness, to bear our shame, to bear our sins, so that you and I could once again be reunited with God. Before his son, Jesus Christ, man had to live by the law. The law was a, a, a group of, 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 of rules and of, of ways of life. And you know what? Let me tell you something. The law, it wasn't bad, but the law, the Bible talks about in the New Testament, the law being a curse. Why? Because the law made men have to be perfect. And I don't know about you, but I'm not perfect. And so mankind in our own, we were never good enough to get to God. And God said, you know what? There is a need for man to get to know me. And before man even realized it, before man even had called out, before man had even cried out to God, God said, there is a plan in place. I am going to send my son, Jesus Christ, to the earth to die for each and every man who comes to this place, that they might know me, that they might be reunited with me, that they might have the opportunity to be connected with God. So you sit here in the church and you've got your Bible. You're sitting in, in service and you're clapping and whatever and you're hearing the word of God. So you say, Pastor Luke, but I chose God. But before you even chose God, he had already chosen you. To the point he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for each and every one of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So you and I have got to live. The change in our perspective is to not know this. As we walk out of these four walls, out of this church, and we go into our workplaces, to our families, to our friends, we have got to understand that it is not us who has yet chosen God, but God, before we even chose him, already knew. He had already chosen us. And he said, you know what? They are so valuable to me that I will pay the ultimate price for each and every one of them, that I will send my son, Jesus Christ, to die so that they could know me. So as you walk out of these four walls and you go into the, to the highways and the byways and you go into the cities and you go into your workplaces and life comes against you and you think that the game may be taken over your life and you think that there may not be hope in your life, understand this church, that first and foremost, God has chosen you. I like to think of it like this. You think of the visual illustration of, of kids lining up on a playground. You know, when they're playing basketball or kickball or dodgeball or whatever it has to do with a round spherical object, generally there's two people that kind of come up and they're the team captains. And those two young kids, they'll kind of go up front and everybody else will stand on a line and they'll start to pick. All right, I got you. And okay, I got you. And I got you. And I got you. And I got you. And they're picking the best off first because they want their team to win. And you guys know, you've seen this on TV, you've seen your kids go through this, whatever it might be, that if, well, who's left? That little scrawny kid, maybe with the red hair, kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> you know the example, you know, because we've all been there, we've all seen that before, and all the, all the decisions, mine, come on, you're on my team. You know how to hold a ball. <laughs> but you know what? We were that scrawny kid. We were that scrawny kid that didn't know how to play, that nobody wanted anything to do with. And you know what? God says, you know what? I'm going to pick that kid first. We didn't know we even needed a Savior. We didn't even know we even needed Jesus Christ. Yet God said, I love you enough to pick you before you even know me. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter if you were an accident. It doesn't matter if your parents got together some time ago in a drunken stupor and nine months later you popped out. It doesn't matter if you're a miracle or if you were planned or not. God had a plan for you. God had picked you before you even it came into existence. And you and I have got to live our lives with the understanding that God chose each and every one of us. God loved us enough. God loved the world enough to send his son the ultimate price. 
Jesus Christ to die on that cross that on the third day he would rise again and be the Savior of us. Are you guys with me this morning? I love in the, in the book of 1 Peter in the second chapter, I'll just go ahead and put it up on the overhead. 1 Peter 2.9 says, you are a chosen generation. You're not just baby boomers. You're not just hippies or, or Generation X or Generation Y or Generation Z or Generation Millennium or whatever else. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He called you out of darkness and brought you into his marvelous light. I love what verse number 10 says going on. And he says that you were once not a people, but now you're a people. You didn't have an identity before. You were sitting on a line. You didn't even know that you needed, you were in line to play a game. And he says, you know what? You were once not a people, but now he has called you and he has brought you into the family. You had once not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Church, you and I, we have been called of Jesus Christ. He, he's paid the price for each and every person. Everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord should be saved. And he put a value upon us by his son, Jesus Christ, so that we could be chosen before we even knew we needed it. And a matter of fact, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, it says that we love him, capital H, because he first loved us, gave us the example, paid the price for us, redeemed us by the blood of Jesus Christ. So as we walk out of this place, no, you're on the winning team. You were picked. There is a jersey with your name on it already before you were born. God is holding up saying, listen, man, you are my team. You are ready. All you got to do is grab that jersey and put it on. Praise God. We're talking about the game changer. Are you with me this morning? Number two. Out of John 15, 16, Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples says, listen, you didn't choose me. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Jesus Christ, number two, said that you were commissioned. Let me say, what does that word commission mean? Let me use this example. Let me visually illustrate this. You know, in the, in the, in the ship in, shipyard industry, they build these huge cruise liners. They build these huge oil tankers, whatever they are. They build these boats in what's called a dry dock. It's a, it's a, it's a square or it's a rectangular area where water can be pumped out and it's on dry land. And they prop this boat up. They weld the pieces together. And over the years, it becomes this huge chunk of metal that can float. But yet it's still on land. And you know the ceremony, thinking back to times like the Titanic, where they have a great ceremony with everybody there who was involved, and they bring somebody up and they smash that, that bottle of champagne against the hull and they name it, and then you see the pictures in the old black and white films of that boat being rolled out of that dry dock into the water. At the commissioning of that boat, what they're saying is this is no longer a chunk of metal on dry land, but they roll it into the water. Now all of a sudden, this boat, this, 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 this ship with a name now has a purpose. Whether it's a cruise liner, whether it's an oil tanker, whatever it might be, it has now been commissioned with a purpose. And Jesus Christ in John the 15th chapter, verse 16 says that you have been appointed to go and bear fruit. Each and every one of us have been commissioned by God to serve a purpose, to go and to bear fruit. In John, the 15th chapter, he equates being uh, um, a vine and being the branches of the vine. And he says that you should go and bear much fruit. You know what fruit is from a, from a plant? It's evidence of its DNA. If you look at an apple tree when there's no apples on it, it's a tree. It's, it's hard to differentiate whether that's a red apple tree or a green apple tree or, a, or a, a golden apple tree. Or let's take it, we live in a citrus area. There's orange trees in our area. There's grapefruit trees in our areas. There's all sorts of different citrus type trees. And when there aren't fruit on those trees, it's tough to differentiate what a grapefruit tree and an orange tree looks like because they're very similar. Yet when that tree begins to bear fruit, you begin to say, ah, I can tell you what that is. That's a grapefruit tree. Ah, that's, a, that's an orange tree. That's an apple tree. Why? Because that tree bears fruit, evidence of its DNA. You and I were called out of darkness. You and I are brought out of ourselves, brought into the family of God. We have been given new DNA by God, and we were appointed. We were set apart. We were placed in this time so that you and I could bear fruit to show the evidence of our DNA. Are you guys with me on that? 
We weren't just called into this place. We didn't just raise our hand, walk the aisles, or accept Jesus Christ into our hearts so that we could sit in a chair, to carry our Bible, to clap at the preacher on Sunday morning, and then go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, being quiet about it. We have all been called to bear fruit. As a matter of fact, the word appointed in the Greek is translated to be fixed, to be made, to be established or to place. God has established you. God has fixed you. God has placed you. God has made you here for a reason, to bear fruit, to continue on in that. You know, Paul the Apostle, in the book of 1 Corinthians, if you've got your Bibles, let's just turn there. In the book of 1 Corinthians, keep your thumbs or your ribbons in, in James we're, or John, we're going to come back. But in 1 Corinthians, in the 12th chapter, Paul the Apostle begins to equate the body of Christ, the, the members of the body of Christ, to the human body. And he says, listen, not everybody serves the same purpose. We are many members of one body. Some of us are the ears. Some of us are the nose. Some of us are the kidneys and the gallbladders. Okay, he doesn't say that part. But then he says, what happens if everybody wants to be the eyes? Then where's the, where's the ears? What happens if everybody wants to be the hands? Then where are the feet? We are all many members of one body. Each and every one of us have an individual purpose. Each and every one of us have an individual calling. Each and every one of us have an individual influence that God has called us to be. And you know what happens when a part of the body, when a certain section of the body begins to function aside from what its primary purpose was? You know what that's called? That's called cancer. When we try to do something that somebody else is over here supposed to do, and we're not, we're not paying attention to where God has put us. We're being uh, contrary to the body of Christ. And in, and, and in 1 Corinthians, Paul the Apostle, Chapter 12, Paul the Apostle writing in verse number 18 says, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. Jesus Christ has come. He's appointed us. He has set us. So that each and every one of us have a calling. Each and every one of us have a purpose. Each and every one of us have an influence. Let me tell you something. I remember Pastor Jim was talking about this. And he was saying to somebody, he says, you know, there are 200,000 people in our city. And if we filled each and every seat in this sanctuary and added as much as we could to the fire marshal standards, we could fit about 3,000 people in this sanctuary. So we have 10 services a week. That's 30,000 people we could seat in this place a week. That's just over 10% of just San Bernardino not including the Ontario, the Riverside, the Ukaipa, the eastern sides, the, 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 the southern sides of the Inland Empire. Just 10% just in this church. The bottom line is, is that it's not just this church's job to influence the people, to go out there and to do something for the kingdom of God, but it's yours and my job to go and to bear fruit. I can't, Pastor Jim can't, Pastor Dan can't go into every house in San Bernardino and preach and teach the gospel, but you can because you know people. You know people who know people. You have influence in your workplace. You have influence with your family. You have the ability to speak and teach and preach the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are called to go and bear fruit. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't know what my position in the body is. Well, start there. Jesus Christ in Matthew 28 chapter said, listen, go to all the world and tell everybody, every creature about Jesus Christ and make them disciples. It is our job to go and to bear fruit. Are you with me? We have got to live our purpose. We have got to do our jobs. I want to show you two pictures. I got two pictures. Let's go ahead and pop it up. There's two pictures of two hockey players. You don't have to know anything about hockey or anything like that. But I want to show you. This is, these are two people. That's Wayne Gretzky on your, what is that? That's your left. And Dominic Hossack on your right. Wayne Gretzky is known as the great one. Dominic Hossack is one of the most winningest goalies in the NHL history. Arguably one of the best goalies in the NHL. Wayne Gretzky is a forward. Dominic Hossack is a goalie. If we just look without even knowing anything about the sport of hockey, you can look at Wayne Gretzky and see that he is clearly different from Dominic Hossack as far as what they wear, their pads. Wayne Gretzky's job was to score goals. Dominic Hossack's job was to stop goals. Now let's take Wayne Gretzky and Dominic Hossack and let's switch them and let's tell Wayne Gretzky based on what he's got, based on the puck that's at his feet with his stick up in the air, you go to the goal and you stop goals and let's tell Dominic you know what Dominic why don't you go and you skid you get out there into the center of the ice and you skate hard and you go try to score goals 
But looking at his pads, looking at the awkwardness of what the goalie has versus what Wayne Gretzky has, you can see that they were pointed. They were set for a purpose. Church, you and I were set for a purpose. And we've got to live our purpose because when we don't live our purpose, when we don't bear the fruit that God has asked us, God has appointed us, God has ordained us, God has anointed us to set, we're ineffective for the kingdom of God. The game changer is it's not just about church. It's not just about Sunday morning. It's about every other moment that you're not in church to get out there, to spread the word of God, to shout the gospel of Jesus Christ, to tell somebody about the goodness of our Lord and Savior who died to save them. Like we just talked about, who chose them. We have been called to bear fruit. Are you guys with me this morning? Number three in this morning. Out of John 15, 60. Jesus says, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. Number three this morning. Church, you and I, we can be history makers. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. What matters is what you do with your life. You know what? History makers aren't the news. History makers aren't those who are in the headlines. Haven't you ever heard the term yesterday's news? History makers aren't the people that make the headlines in the newspaper. History makers are the people that influence the lives of those around them. I could ask you who the third richest man in America is, and I'm sure most people couldn't answer that. We know that Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are right up there, but who's number three? Wouldn't you say that that's an influential history maker type of person? If I asked you who Pete Conrad was, you'd probably look at me and say, ah, is he a baseball player? Third man on the moon. He walked on the moon. That's an influential person. How many of us can say that we've done that? Yet if I asked you, who was somebody that, in, uh, that influenced your life, that, that taught you to be a better person? I bet you, you could name somebody. If I asked you, who was somebody that makes you feel good about yourself, that encourages you daily? I bet you, you could name somebody. Because influence is not based on headlines. Influence is based on what you do to somebody else's life. And history isn't about what you do with your business. History isn't about what you do with those around you. History is about what you do to the person that you influence into. That's why I say it doesn't matter if you're old. It doesn't matter if you're young. You can sow into the life of somebody around you. You can speak the word of God. All this and all it takes is for somebody to go and to share the word of God with that one person. And that one person, you don't know, that one person is the next Billy Graham or the next Reinhard Bonnke of our generation that might go to Africa, might go to Europe, might go to America and bring millions to Christ, all because of a faithful servant that's witness to them. You don't know your influence. You guys with me this morning? It's quiet in the house. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. I love this. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Verse number one starts out with, therefore. We can't continue on with a verse that starts with therefore without understanding what was just said before. Because as dad's taught us before, whenever you hear therefore, it's there for a reason. Do you know what Hebrews, the 11th chapter is? We call that the hall of faith. You know, the baseball league has the Hall of Fame. You know, the the football league has the Hall of Fame. We have Hebrews 11. And in Hebrews 11, it talks about those by faith. If you read it, by faith Abraham, by faith Sarah, by faith Moses, you know, and so forth and so on. It's the patriarchs. It's those who stood and believed and, and had the promises of God. Most of them, many of them who had not seen the promises of their life from God fulfilled, yet they remained faithful to God to bring us to the point where we're at. And he says, these are the great ones of our faith. This is, the, this is the, the, the hall of faith for us. This is the people that we are to look up to, the people that we should all know about. And then he comes on, and the first word of this 12th chapter, right after speaking about the hall of faith, and he says, therefore, we also. You guys get where I'm going? You're quiet here today. What I'm saying is this, is that the writer of Hebrews equates the hall of faith. He tells us all about the great patriarchs of our past, about Abraham and about Sarah, about about all the different, uh, about Moses. And he says, I don't even have time to talk about Samson and David and all the others. And, And then he goes on to say, therefore, we also, church, you and I, 
have the ability by God, given to us by God, to have our names written into the hall of faith because of our actions, because of our beliefs, because of what we stand on, because we can be history makers. And it doesn't matter how old you are because Abraham and Sarah were well past their time in history making, yet God saw them faithful and counted them to righteousness. You and I could be history makers. Let me, let me show you. And if we continue on in Hebrews 12.1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, you know the nosebleed seats in the, in the auditoriums? You know those $5 tickets that you can go sit at the top row where binoculars don't even let you see the game? You've got to bring a telescope with you? I heard it once said that the, the cloud, back in the day, these great auditoriums, the seats up high, the cheap seats were called the clouds. You were sitting in the clouds. So he says, therefore, we also have such a full stadium rooting us on, cheering us on, that even the nosebleeds are full rooting you, watching you make history. So, so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the sin which easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This isn't a sprint. This is something to carry on to make history. You're going to have to run with endurance. In 1946, a young African-American player entered into the National Baseball League. He faced persecution, he faced hate, he faced death threats, but he quickly rose to the top. He earned Rookie of the Year that year. And two years later, he became the MVP of the National Baseball League. Jackie Robinson swung the gates wide open from freedom from oppression, and he inspired millions. One of the most valuable rookie cards in, in baseball collection. And you know what he says after all of that? All his life, you know what he said about his life? He said this. A life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. It's not about MVP. It's not about rookie of the year. It's not about how many home runs you hit. It's not about how much you do. It's about the impact that you have on the lives of those around you. Church, we can't always, I can't go out, Pastor Dan can't go out, Pastor Jim can't go out and, and reach everybody in San Bernardino alone, yet you are the ones that have the ability. That's why Pastor Jim has always taught us as the church that we are all full-time ministers of the gospel, that we should bear fruit and that our fruit should remain. Our fruit should be lasting. The legacy, the impact that we have on the lives around us is where it matters. It's not about landing on the moon. It's not about how much money you make. It's not about how well your business is. It's not about how bad your business is. It's about the influence that you have on the lives of those around you. God sees each and every one of you, each and every one of us in this building right now are influential people. You know somebody that you can speak to. You know somebody that you can be a witness to. You know somebody that you can share the love of God with and you might be that only person that has the ability to do so. Are you guys with me this morning? Jesus Christ said that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send laborers across. We can be people of influence. Are you guys with me? One more this morning. John 15 chapter, verse number 16, last for this morning. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Last this morning, you have access to the Father. You and I have access to the Father. That statement that Jesus Christ makes at the end of that 16th verse carries three essential parts. It carries three essential parts. Number one is we have access to God. We have access to the Father. He says, he equates the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the ruler of all the universe as his Father and ours. And you and I have access to go before. Secondly, that implies because if whatever you ask of the Father in my name, it means that you and I have the weight of a good name behind us. What is a reputation without a good name? And you and I have the best name, the name above all names, Jesus Christ bearing us carrying us and our reputation and our righteousness so we can petition the King of kings and the Lord of lords with the name above every other name. And finally, the third thing is that the answer would be promised to us. But I can't leave you with just that thought, that whatever you ask, you get. You have access to the Father. I can't just leave you with that verse when Jesus says, whatever you ask of the Father, you're going to get. Because you know what? A lot of us come to that. We think of that. We say, well, great, awesome. God gives me free will to ask for anything that I want. 
But we got to take a mature and we got to take an adult approach to that verse. We got to, you know, you may be baby Christians, you may not even understand what we're talking about, but let me, let me show you, let me educate. You might have been in this all your life, you might have, have, been, have been serving God all your life, but we've got to take a mature understanding of what Jesus Christ is saying. You know, in the old days, as a king, and he would send a servant out to, to decree something or to, to petition another monarch for something or, or so, forth, so forth and so on. And how he would do that is if he couldn't leave his throne, if he couldn't leave his kingdom, he would give that servant his ring. And on his ring bore his seal, his name, his title, everything about it. And that servant would go in the name of the king. And he would present that and he would show the ring. And that ring it was as if that servant himself was the king. And that servant better make that petition in the will of the king. Because now he's got the authority to speak on behalf of the king. And if that servant speaks out of line, speaks out of agreement with what the king says, you know, wars are started that way. Drama is started that way. And in that servant, in those times, if he would go and he'd speak out of line based on the authority of the king, how many know he would come back with a sharp axe ready for his neck? Not to say that when you and I are that way that God's got a sharp axe waiting for us. But let me say this, that we have the name of Jesus Christ backing us as we go before the Father. So bearing that name, we have to understand what is more important, our opinion, our perspective, or God's opinion, God's perspective. So often we approach the throne of grace, we approach God with the petitions of our lives, and we ask things based on our opinions, based on what we want, based on what we think we need. Yet God is our Father who knows what we want, who knows what we need. Let me say it like this. My, my son, if he was to come to me and say, Dad, I want cake for dinner. Let me tell you something. As a dad, I'm going to answer that question, and I'm going to give him what he asked for. I'm going to give him. He asked me for dinner. I'm going to give him dinner. But let me tell you something. As a dad, I know that having cake for dinner is not good for him. So I'm not giving him cake, but I'll give him what he asked for, which was dinner. Oftentimes we go before God and we say, God, I need this. And we're so focused on the cake. We're so focused on our objection. We're so focused on our perspective that when we ask and we go before the throne of grace and we ask God for something, the prayer might have been answered over here, but we're waiting for our answer because we say it's this. When God says, I'm your father, I know what's best. Jesus Christ, when he taught us how to pray, in the book of Matthew, he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Jesus Christ, as an example, in the garden before Judas betrays him, before he goes into his trial and crucifixion, praying before God, says, God, if it at all possible, let this cup pass before me. But then he goes and follows that very statement with, not my will, but yours be done. Yet so often we pray to God hoping for our will, for our things, for what we want, but God is our Father. And when we shed our perspective, when we shed our needs and our desires, and we know that God is looking out for us, why? Because he chose us, he placed value upon us, he appointed us, and he wants us to be history makers, and he says, I'm going to do everything, church, that I can in my power to make sure that you do what's right, and to make sure that everything that comes from me builds you up. He's not going to feed us cake for dinner when we need vegetables. He's going to do what's right. Yet you and I have to have the mature and the adult approach to this and understand that when God gives us something, when we ask of God, we ask in his will. We ask for what he wants in our lives, not what we want in our lives. Because he knows what's best for us. That's tough. Let me conclude with this. Last verse for, the, for this, uh, this morning. I'll pop it up on the overhead. Romans 12.2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That you might prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When you pray, when you go to the Lord and you ask for his will to be done, how do you know what his will is in your life? Well, first off, you've got to be transformed because you go to God with your old thinking, with your old, your old thought process. What's your old thought process? You're looking out for number one. That's the old man. When you transform and you begin to say, you know what, I'm a member of the body. God, do what in my life is best for me. Do what in my life what is best for the body. Do what in my life what is best for the Father. Now all of a sudden your mind is transforming. You're beginning to think differently. You're beginning to ask questions differently. You're beginning to approach God differently. And it says that you might prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God in your life. To go out there, to bear fruit, to be history makers. Church, this, is, this goes so far beyond the four walls of this building. 
It's not just about church on Sunday. It's not just about church on Wednesday. It's about the shout of God out into each and every, to the highways and the byways, to call those, to compel those, that God loves them, that God has chosen them. So that we might be effective in the body of Christ, that we might bear good fruit, that our fruit might have a legacy and not rot on the counter, unused. Well, praise God. Did you guys get something out of that this morning? All right, here's what I want to do. I want to ask everybody, just for a moment, to remain seated. Please don't get up, don't walk around. I want to ask you a question. The Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. So let me ask you a question. I want you to examine yourself within your own heart. Let's go over those answers that you have together. If you were to leave this place this morning and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a simple question. Well, why don't we go over that answer together? You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I think I get to heaven. I sure hope I get to heaven. Can you show me where it says in the word of God that because you think that you're going to get to heaven, because you hope that you're going to get to heaven, because you have the most positive outlook on life, that you're going to get to heaven, that you're going to find your way there. Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere in the Bible will you find that. You know, you might say, well, you know, Pastor Luke, just to be honest with you, I don't, I don't know if I even believe that heaven or hell exists. Well, can I say this to you? Just because you in your mind don't believe that hell is real or that heaven is real doesn't mean that it's not. God thought it important enough to mention to you and I in the word of God. Jesus Christ thought it important enough to talk about. Therefore, it's important enough for you and I to take it serious. And it's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks and go and stand in the slow lane of the freeway. Lo and behold, you'd meet one face to face. I'm here to love you enough. I'm here to tell you enough. I'm here to, to respect you enough to quit playing games with you and tell you the honest truth. That doesn't matter what you believe, whether it is or it isn't, hell is a very real place. Heaven is a very real place. And it's time for us to quit playing games about it. Well, but pastor, you know, I wasn't raised as a, as a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim or any other type of philosophical thought or world religion. So doesn't that mean then that by default that I'm going to get into the kingdom of heaven? Doesn't that mean that I'm going to go to heaven? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, as a Muslim, or any other type of world religion or philosophical thought, that means that you're going to get into heaven. By default, that makes you right to get into heaven. Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere in the Word will you find that. Well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I was, I was baptized as a child. I, I was christened as a, as a baby. I attended Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes. You know, my parents took me to church on Christmas and on Easter. I'm here today. All my life they told me that I was a Christian. Can, doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you, as a child somebody blew smoke and water over you because you were baptized or christened as a baby that you're going to get your way into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you attended Sabbath school, Sunday school, or catechism classes that you're going to get your way into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because your parents brought you to church on Christmas and on Easter that you, you carry your Bible, you sit in church today, that you're going to get your way into heaven like it's you can pay your penance to God. Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because somebody told you that you were a Christian, because somebody gave you a title, because you gave yourself a title, that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere. That's like me saying, I'm going to go down to Sports Chalet and buy a Dodgers uniform, go sit in the dugout of the Dodger Stadium and say that I'm a Dodger. At no point am I a member of the Dodgers organization. The security guys are going to come. They're going to drag me out of that dugout. They're going to lock me up. Yet we think that because we give ourselves the title, because we give ourselves a name, that we're going to get into heaven because of that. But nowhere in the Word of God will you find that. Well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I'm a, I'm a good person. My good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. I, I do more good in my life than I do bad. You know, I've never robbed the 7-Eleven. I don't cheat on my taxes. You know, I even give to humanitarian efforts to help fight world hunger. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? God surely wouldn't send good people to hell. Can you show me where it says in the Bible that your good deeds get you into heaven? That because you've never robbed a 7-Eleven, because you pay your taxes, because you even give to charitable organizations to help fight world hunger or whatever it might be, that you're going to get into heaven. Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. I'm here to love you enough, to respect you enough, to honor you enough, to tell you the truth. You say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, um, I know who Jesus is. I know the stories of, of Moses and of Jonah and of David. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven?
can you show me where it says in the Bible, in the Word of God, that because you know who Jesus is, because you know the stories of Moses and of Jonah and of David, that you're going to get your way in heaven. Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Nowhere will you find that. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is. Yet they're not finding their way into heaven. There's something more to it than that, guys. Well, but Pastor Luke, I've got a, a, a card in my wallet that says I'm a member to a church. I carried the pastor's Bible. I was an usher. I sang in the choir. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Because you carried your pastor's Bible because you were an usher. Because you sang in the choir that you're going to get into heaven. No, where will you find that? As a matter of fact, in the book of John, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? Let me tell you a little bit about Nicodemus before I give you Jesus' response. Nicodemus was a religious leader of his time. Because he was a religious leader of his time, that tells us that he had spent most of his young life studying and memorizing the Word of God. Nicodemus said all the right things. Nicodemus did all the right things. He wore the right clothes. He gave to the poor. He could preach from the pulpits of his church. Yet Jesus looks to Nicodemus and tells Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. What does born again mean? We've heard that term, Hollywood, popular culture, society, whatever have you, has made a mockery out of that term. You think of radical, weirdo, out of control, crazy Christianity. But you know what? From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given Jesus Christ all of your heart and all of your life. Everybody look at me, look at me. God's not after your mental ascent towards him. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation speaking to the church. People like you and I, guys, sitting in a service, doing the right things, doing good things, says, listen, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. What does that mean? Jesus Christ says when he comes back, when it comes time for you and I to meet him face to face, he better find us hot or cold because if he finds us lukewarm, he will spit us out. He will reject us out. He will cast us out of the kingdom of heaven. Don't be deceived in thinking that if you're living lukewarm, you're going to get into the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me tell you what it means. It means this. It means that you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out. Occasional church attendance, a token prayer here and again. Maybe you even wear a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. You've been doing your own thing instead of God's thing. you got too much of the world in you to enjoy God. you got too much of God in you to enjoy the world. You're like, you do what I like to say. You're riding the fence. Jesus Christ says, if I come back, if it comes time for you to meet me face to face and I see you in that condition, I will spit you out. I will cast you out of the kingdom of God. You are deceived in thinking that you're going to get there. Jesus Christ said, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except through him. So you know what you say, Pastor Luke, I appreciate the effort that you're going through. You find God your way, I'll find God my way. We'll all get to heaven the same. Love wins. Let me tell you something. Let's not do it your way this morning. Let's not do it my way this morning. Let's do it God's way. In a moment, here's what I'm going to do. If you've never given all of your heart, all your life to Jesus Christ, if you're not sure maybe you did that some point in your life and you don't know, or if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, in a moment, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three, and go bang. Smack my hand on my Bible just like that. Make a loud noise. What I want to ask you to do is I want you to be bold. I want you to pop your hand up. We'll do it all together at the same time. And what you're doing is when you pop in your hand up, you're saying, you know what? I want to give all of my heart. I want to give all of my life to Jesus Christ. Well, but Pastor Luke, if I raise my hand, somebody's going to see me. I'm going to be embarrassed. You know what? This is a warm and welcome and loving place and no, you're not going to be embarrassed because somebody saw you. But even if you were, wouldn't it be better to have a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? Let me tell you this. Jesus Christ said that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So all across this auditorium, all at the same time, God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in. You have got to ask him. You have got to invite him into your life. Remember, he has already chosen you by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross, a beaten, bloody mess, so that you and I could have salvation. There is no other way through, but through Jesus Christ. So all across this auditorium, all at the same time, if you've never given Jesus Christ all of your heart, all your life, in a moment, I want you to pop your hand up. If you haven't, if you're not sure, maybe you did it as a child, but you don't know, don't leave this place without making sure. 
The Bible says that our life is but a vapor. You don't know what tomorrow holds. If you've been living your own thing, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, you've been running from God instead of to God, been living lukewarm in a moment, I want you to pop your hand up. Say, I'm going to go forward with God all the days of my life. I want to give him all of my heart, all of my life. If that's you in the auditorium, all hands are getting ready to go up all across this place. One, two, three. Let's go ahead and put your hands up. Come on, let's see him. One, I got you, God. Praise God. One, where you at? I see it. Two, praise God. Where are we at? Three, four, five. All right, praise God, I see you. Where are we at? I see. Give me a little wave so I can see you over there. Six, I got you, sister. Six wise people. Anybody else? Give me a little wave over there. I can't, I can't quite see your hand. Where are you at? Seven, eight, praise God. Where are we at? Nine, I got you. Ten, I got you, brother. Eleven. Eleven wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you if that's you. Put your hand up. Where are we at? I got you already, brother. Where we, in the family room? Is that where, where are you pointing at, Byron? All right, 12, I got you, sister. 12 wise people, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. If that's you, go and pop your hand up. Where are we at? Where are we at? Give me a little wave for your hand. I see you, I see you. 13. 13 wise people. Anybody else in this house today say, man, I wish this guy shut up. I'm ready to get out of here. Pop that hand up. Anybody else? 13 wise people. I didn't embarrass them. If you know there's 13, where are you? Number 14 and 15. Where are you at? Stop resisting God. Stop messing with God. And let's make this the moment that you go forward for God. Pop your hand up today. Where are you at? Well, praise God for 13 wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. I want to ask all 13 and the seven others of you that didn't raise your hand, that should have raised your hand. And I want you to grab your coat your sweater, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. And I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to be bold and I want you to come. We're all going to stand together and I want you to come and I want you to meet me here. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all of your heart, all your life. Let us help you. Come on and meet me up here today, right now. If that's you, get out of your chair and come on down. You can come. Come on. You can come. You can come. You're Come on, they're coming. You're welcome, come on. Come on home, come home. Help me know you are near. You can come, they're still coming. Get out of your chair, come on down. Get off, come on down here. Hey guys, this is what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of you, a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here? This is Pastor Dave Simmons. I know you thought, man, Pastor Luke, you're pretty. No, this guy is where it at. He is the coolest, the nicest guy you will ever meet. What he's going to do, you don't get saved by just raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to come into your life. So what he's going to do, he's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's just going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to introduce to you what we have here at the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. When you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer, somebody to help you get buff so and get you strong in the things of, of your muscles and stuff. We're going to give you a friend, somebody that will meet with you before a service that'll, that's a spiritual personal trainer that will help you get strong in the things of the Lord so you don't go back to the junk that you came from. Give you some free literature, a book that our pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. Easy reading. Pastor Jim has a third grade reading level. He wrote it with a third grade reading level. You can read it. It's okay. So what he's going to do is going to take you right over there. All right, would you guys go right with Pastor Dave? Dave. Praise God. Hallelujah. Woo! 